gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to fellowship here around your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us so much. I just ask that you would filter out any error, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had come to verse 35 of chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? And the first thing that I notice here is that Christ is a genitive. And those of you who are familiar with the Greek know that love of Christ is a subjective genitive, whereas your love for Christ would be an objective genitive. And I believe this genitive to be subjective. I believe it to be the love of Christ. The objective genitive would diminish grace. It would diminish the finished work of Christ, which is why most translators, I believe, have taken this uh, genitive to be subjective. Who shall separate us from Christ's love? I don't know how many times I've heard Christians say, well, I don't feel like God loves me. And you'll hear, hear many uh, a Christian say, well, nobody can separate us from our love for Christ. I, I believe this, Steve, you know, or his love for us, except us. I mean, you can do it. You are the only one. You are the one power that can separate you from the love of Christ, and you wouldn't believe the number of Christians that believe that. Yet the Holy Spirit said through Paul to Timothy, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That's 2 Timothy 2.13. Now, I, wanna, I want us to look at the seven words in this verse. I've spent some time looking at these words. Seven words. Uh, tribulation. Uh, Thlipsis is the word. It means pressure. Stress. And that stress will always be there. They, they might differ from one Christian to another. We have the pressure of the conflict between flesh and spirit in the context here, as we saw in Romans chapter 7. We've got the pressures of the responsibilities of daily life. I believe we are to take peaceful confidence that those pressures cannot separate us from Christ's love. And looking at the word distress, Stenachery is the word. It means a very narrow place. It's a, the word means a feeling of confinement. Not much room to maneuver. If you've ever, you know, stood in a small closet or in a small space where you couldn't even turn around, that is what the word basically means. We can look at, at persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword, and we'll look at those. But this is the one that I find most common as compared to the rest. Most of, of you have enough to eat. Most of us have enough to eat. We have enough clothes to wear. When I was a kid, there were starving people in China, and if I didn't finish my food, I got I got into all kinds of trouble when I suggested 
uh, that they send it to them. The word means a narrow place. There's always someone caught in a job or, or a marriage that's confining. But the truth is that most of us are in a very narrow place. Yet God is the one who has ordained our walk. He doesn't allow anything to touch our lives except it be for our ultimate good. You're in a narrow place. Nobody recognizes your potential. I meet many a Christian who feels trapped in one thing or another, marriage, job. But how can you be trapped when you're in the hands of the Almighty God? How can it be that the world is not recognizing your greatness and your potential? When you're where God wants you to be, you are where God wants you to be. It's a, it's a fact of, of, of scripture that many Christians struggle with. God has you right where he wants you. If you are not where God wants you to be, you're not Christ's. And immediately somebody, you know, will say, well, then I must not be Christ because I'm not where I want to be. Contrary to popular belief, that's a phrase I seem to be using a lot these days, you are always where he wants you to be. Or he isn't God, and he's not working all things. He's not really working all things according to the counsel of his good pleasure, his good will and pleasure. I believe for America, this word distress is very fitting. It's astounding to me, absolutely amazing to me how many Christians are not happy. The word happy means blessed. We of all people ought to rejoice. The almighty God who created the universe, hung the stars in the sky, and, and everything in it knows you by name. He's branded you on the palms of his hands. He knows the way that you take, and when he has tested you, you shall come forth as gold. It is God Almighty who has declared in his word that he will never leave you nor forsake you. That he'll never cease to sustain and uphold you He knows every tear that you shed, and he bottles those tears. He knows every hair on my head, which doesn't take a lot of counting these days. Why should I not rejoice? In the midst of, of great suffering, should I not rejoice? We are told in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always. And I challenge you to look at the context of that passage sometime. Rejoice always. What I wonder about this verse, and it's not there, I would have put it in there, and, and so obviously I'm, I wouldn't be a good author of, of scripture. Who shall separate us from Christ's love? Shall riches and successes and, and fame? Note that none of those are there. It almost appears, you know, as we look at this 35th verse, that those things are not very interesting to God. Obviously they weren't. I mean, that, that would be one thing that you could conclude from that verse. Another conclusion you could reach is that, well, those things 
wouldn't separate you from the love of Christ. I mean, you know, you're more likely, you're much more likely to think that Christ doesn't love you if you're in tribulation or a narrow, restricted space than you are if, if you have lots of money and, and fame and, and perfect health and so forth. And, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I do know, I do know what Proverbs tells us. Give me neither poverty nor riches. And folks, I, I'd be absolutely terrified by riches at, just as much as I would be by poverty. But they're not in the verse. Obviously, the way the Lord is ordained for us is the way of discipline. If, you, if you're familiar with the epistle to the Hebrews, you know that. That we be conformed to the image of his son. And hardships produce growth. Hebrews chapter 12. I want us to look at this. Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about but with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin, that's, that's articulated, the sin, singular, which I believe refers to the old man, which doth so easily beset, beset us, and it does, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author, and finisher of our faith. In other words, nothing can separate us from his love. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's continue reading. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. God disciplines his sons. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, Note that this is because we are sons, not because we sin, which is a common mis misconception. Verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Verse 8, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers all then are ye bastards and not sons verse 9 furthermore we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live verse 10 for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, get this, he for our profit, and here it is, the purpose, so that, so that we might be partakers of his holiness. Verse 11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth 
the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So let's look at the word persecution. And it means just that. But that persecution, however, can be, and this is my opinion on this, this can, it can be both physical and spiritual. More Christians, folks, have died for their faith in Christ in your lifetime than in the first 500 years of Christianity. People do suffer physical, extreme physical persecution because of their love for Christ. And you will, if you live very much longer, if you are serious with this book, if you are serious with the Word of God, you will as well, if the Lord tarries. Up here as a guest on Fox News or MSNBC or CNN, one of the mainstream news networks, and, and, and just give them honest, straightforward answers from this book of your convictions concerning the Word of God. And the person in the work of Jesus Christ do that you won't have a chance they'd cut to a commercial and when they came back you know your chair the chair that you were sitting in it, it would probably be be empty the day will come when we may suffer physical persecution in this country If our Lord tarries because of our faith in Jesus Christ now I'm not willing to say which is worse the physical or the day after day spiritual persecution what I do know is that you are pressured every day with biblical error every day there is the semblance of a false gospel that is preached to you in, in one way or another and it's easy to fall into the path of error but not even that can separate you from the love of Christ But just know, just know that you can suffer persecution simply by telling someone you could never do anything to cause Christ to stop loving you. We tend to think persecution is someone throwing rocks at us, you know, taking a, you know, shooting at us, you know, chasing us with a machete. I don't have any problem suggesting to you folks that even the words famine and nakedness could very well have a spiritual connotation. Famine, as in you're being starved for the Word of God. Nakedness in the, in the spiritual sense of that word. It was to His people that our Lord wrote, we read about this in in the, in the church, the letter to the church of, I believe, Laodicea, buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. In fact, I have no problem suggesting that all seven of the words mentioned in the 35th verse have as much of a spiritual meaning as they do a physical meaning. Pressured, confined to a narrow space, persecuted, which literally means the word, folks, in the Greek, if you look at it in the Greek, literally means pursued, chased, Hungry, naked, 
endangered species as you are, who are sometimes killed in the spiritual sense of the term, not from God's perspective, but from yours or theirs, the word persecution literally means to be chased. If you've ever had someone chasing you, that's what the word means. Pursued because, because of who you are, because of your testimony of faith, for the sake of the truth. The word hunger, a scarcity of food. Many of God's people today are starving for the truth of this book, folks. Starving for the truth of the word of God. The word, the meaning behind the, the word sword in the Greek, the word literally means knife, but it denotes warfare and judicial punishment. And folks, look, it is not my intention to minimize the physical aspect of the words in, in this text. But I don't believe that we should ignore the spiritual persecuted by a legalistic, law-oriented, world religious system based upon human merit that considers itself spiritual but diminishes the grace of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's difficult to get the thought that the, the Holy Spirit intended to convey. You know, you can mention something in the Bible that many Christians will find immensely interesting. I've learned this, where that they become utterly obsessed with it, but they don't seem to be too obsessed with the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And folks, this book, this book, despite what you've been taught your whole life, is not a book about things which entertains the mind or tickles the ears, and it is not, this book is not an instruction book on how to gain merit with God. It is the revelation of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Oh, I wish you could wrap your mind around that. And there, and that and the fact that there are enemies of the cross of Christ. They hate it. They despise it. I'm talking about religious people here. They detest any mention of his grace in the strictest since there's the terrible temptation to take your eyes off of Christ and, and place them upon self or famine. One can't read that verse without thinking of, of Amos 8.11. Amos 8.11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And as we go through these seven words, the temptation is to simply look at the physical aspect and not consider the spiritual. Now I know, I know there are those whom the Lord loves who do not have enough food to eat. They don't have enough clothes to wear. But there is also a horrible famine for the hearing of the word of God. I've quoted verses, you know, for people to tell me, yeah, I know it says that, Steve, but, but I don't believe that. And I say, but, but I just quoted a verse. And then there are those that, it's just a, the polar opposite of that. They're starved. This is the word of God. If this is not the word of God, then, folks, then I don't want to preach. And I don't want to teach. I know that there is a famine for the word of God. It is difficult to find somebody someone who's dedicated to teaching the truth of this book. I surf channel after channel looking for that. I can't find it. I very rarely find that. I know there's many of you out there 
you you realize this as well. I receive emails, messages, letters, phone calls from from people who have opened my eyes to things that I never saw in this book. And I love that. I am sure not the source of all truth. I mean, man, oh man, there are those of you out there that know more about this book than I'll ever know. And I know it when I talk to you and, and you talk to me. I don't profess to know all truth. I'm looking at the verse just like you are. And if I'm wrong, please tell me. I don't even care if you do it unlovingly. I want to know. I want to know the truth of this book. For years, I experienced a famine in the Word. I'd bring up verses to other pastors just to hear them say, well, oh, that's, that's not for you to know. Well, you know, why did God put it there? Peril or sword. Of course, there's no doubt the physical aspects of that. People who don't have enough food to eat or clothes to wear, people who are in all kinds of peril, disease, difficulty, or war. But please don't miss the fact that there is also in every one of these a spiritual tribulation, a spiritual distress, a spiritual persecution, a spiritual famine, a spiritual nakedness. The world religious system and of our present generation, it, it may strip you bare, but it cannot separate you from Christ's love for you. I once knew a Christian back in, in the 80s that was fired from his job when he shared his faith. There's that kind of peril. Folks, we have an enemy going about seeking whom he may devour. I would not in any way diminish the physical aspects of this. My heart bleeds for brothers and sisters who are in physical distress and physical persecution and in physical danger by sword. Yet to be consistent, I believe that there is also a spiritual sword. And we know that to be the Word of God itself. Therefore, not even the Word of God itself can separate us from the love of Christ. Because it is by His Word that we know that Christ loves us. He loves us. Dearly beloved, Christ loves us loves you. God loves you. I think it's worth noting that the Holy Spirit could have just avoided all seven of these words and simply just said, nothing shall separate us from Christ's love. Just one word, nothing. Why didn't he do that? That's going out on a limb, okay? Now, in the final few verses of this chapter, we'll go on to list 10 additional things that will never separate us from the love of God, bringing the total to 17 things that cannot separate us from his love. And if you know anything about my past videos, you know that in the Bible, 17 symbolizes what? It symbolizes overcoming the enemy and complete victory. The very reason why nothing can separate us from Christ's love 
is because what he did for us can't be undone. It's because of what he did for us. It's because he chose us. We didn't choose him. We can't lose something that we never earned to begin with. The reason why nothing can separate us from Christ's love is because he loves us, because we are God's children. There are, there are more reasons than we could possibly even recall or remember. A religious system based on human merit, much of, of which does not understand the love that Christ has for them, Folks, just imagine, imagine the change that would come upon every one of God's children. Imagine the change that would just come upon each individual child of God, any child of God. If only they believed, if only, if all they believed was that Christ loved them and never doubted that endless love. Verse 36, for it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. Thy sake, for thy sake, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, most every commentary, folks, that I've read says that it says it's the world who has accounted or reckoned us as sheep to be slaughtered. I do not hold that view. Psalm 44, 11, you have given us up as sheep to be devoured. You have scattered us among the nations. Psalm 44, 22, yet for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And the word slaughtered there, the word means butchered. Paul's quoting the psalmist here. I have no problem with that slaughter being taken literally. There's no doubt that we are to take that literally. But there is also no doubt that there is a, a spiritual aspect related to those words as well. God reckons, the word is reckon, he reckons his sheep to be butchered. And note that it is daily, all day long, every day, according to the meaning of the text and the grammar. What is butchered? Slaughtered. Butchered, as in sacrificed. We are told to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. I die daily, said Paul. The word sacrifice there in the original text, the word sacrifice slaughtered first occurrence of the word of this word was spoken uh, was said of the lamb of god our lord jesus christ he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer so opened he not his mouth now why does the text say that he didn't open his mouth because he had no intention of avoiding the cross. Let that sink in for a moment. Do we avoid the cross that crucifies? We have been identified with Christ, folks. We hear Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. That's not physical death. We read in Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Dead to sin, Romans 6, 11, but alive unto Christ. We know that it was the old man, the sin nature, the flesh, that received a death blow. The death of the cross crucified with Christ. And so I believe we are being shown what that means in our case. In all of the Word of God, our, our death, a word, a, the word death, 
a word that means separation, that's what the word means, separation, reveals the fact that we have been separated from what? Well, we've been, we died to a lot of things, separated from ourselves to Christ, separated from the old man by being made a new creation in Christ, separated from self-dependence to God-dependence. And our Lord had no intention of avoiding the cross. The word death means separation. Death, as in butchered. Butchered, slaughtered, equals death, equals separation. For us, you and me, separation from a former way of life through the death of his cross upon which we were crucified with Christ. I believe I'm staying within the, the general context here. And that separation is in contrast with that which will not separate us from the love of Christ. Because of the death slash separation that it's occurred, that has occurred, no death separation is possible in our present context. We are accounted as those who through death, that is the death of a cross, as those who are becoming less dependent upon self which was crucified with Christ, where we, you and I, become dependent upon Christ, not self. Just as Jesus said, it's the Father doing his, his works through him. So taken literally, the text is teaching us that we can die to this body, but we can never die to his love. That's and that's pretty much obvious. But taken spiritually, the text is teaching us that there is purpose in our being reckoned as sheep to be slaughtered. The next verse, verse 37, says that in, in, note the word in, in all these things we are presently more than conquerors, not after these things, okay, but in all these things. This is one word in the Greek which literally says, we more than conquer. One word that says, we more than conquer. It's a compound word, who pair, you've heard me talking about that, in our place, in nakao, conquer, literally means exceedingly conquer. That can only be Christ, through Christ. Used of one who is completely and overwhelmingly victorious. That's, that's the meaning behind the word. And it only occurs once in all of the Bible, in all scripture, right here in this verse. The intensive prefix hooper or hyper hoop or hooper it, it adds the idea of surpassing victory or preeminent conqueror. More than conquer. How? Through the one having loved us. And it's an aorist. The text doesn't say through the one loving us continually, though we know he does. But to be true to the text here, where we're at right now, it's an aorist, but through the one having once loved us, aorist tense, through the one having completely loved us all, and it's, it's plural, in past time, that is what the text says. And we can't change it. We just can't change it. If I could summarize the verses that, you know, we've looked at here, these two verses, 
in one of the most dramatic passages, I believe, in all of Scripture, we can see that he is opening up the fullness of his heart to tell us just how much he loves us. And so I believe it deserves much more than just a passing glance. You know, I'll just kind of brush through it, which is what we often do when we're reading Scripture. Folks, this is the Word of God, not the mind of the Apostle Paul. And in words that, that can only be described as heavenly poetry, in the same vein as, as the Song of Saul, God wants us to know what? How much He loves us. In spite of all the tribulation that we could possibly encounter in this lifetime, both physical and spiritual. And if that fails to tug at the heartstrings of you as a new creation, then nothing will. The physiological makeup of us as, as, as a human being, we long to be told that we are loved by someone else. We place such a value on our expression of love for one another John Lennon did. Now, whether through letters and cards or phone calls or, or an occasion, the occasional hug or embrace, we incorporate that greatest of all things into movies and films and documentaries. Even songs are written about it. And yet, when it comes to such a lovely passage as this, for whatever reason, we tend to run past these words while in a hurry to get somewhere else or that we to later wonder whether God loves us or not. When we should be kneeling before our God at, at every word with the knowledge that it's more than just printed text, paper and ink. It is the very heart of our Lord yearning, reaching out to us, yearning to draw us nearer to Himself. I've often mentioned in past videos that God has nothing against us. Folks, God has nothing against you. He loves you with an endless love that we can in this life barely even comprehend till next time i love you all i truly do thanks for watching